Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I hope everyone had a very blessed holiday over the uh, Christmas weekend. The 12th chapter of Acts, we have the account of Peter's arrest by, by Herod. Uh, he's thrown into prison. Uh, he's kept securely. The believers get together. Uh, you all know the story. You know, pray that Peter be released. Uh, the, the Lord releases him and uh, delivers him, and Peter knocks on the door, and they don't believe it, so uh, they keep on praying, and they, they won't let Peter in. Everybody's heard the story, I'm sure a hundred times. I want to suggest to you uh, in the survey, uh, we could rush by and, and say there's, well, there's a, a historical incident in Peter's life, and and I'm certain that's true, but I want to look uh, just a little bit deeper for the spiritual lesson uh, that's there for us. Uh, first of all, we're told at the beginning of the 12th chapter that Herod decided that he was going to vex the church. Certain ones in the church, uh, the word there in the Greek means to treat badly, to inflict, to make angry. Uh, there's an indication in the, lang la uh, the language that uh, these are definite people that are to be vexed. Now, if you could just look at the, the train uh, of my thought for just a moment, there is in this account uh, not only the historical veracity of, of Peter's arrests and deliverance, miraculous deliverance by the Lord, but there's also an illustration uh, for us in how God works in our lives. Peter belonged to God before the foundation of the world. Peter went through all kinds of, of difficult circumstances. We hear the Lord uh, say uh, that Peter, you know, Satan has desired thee that he might sift thee as wheat, but I prayed for thee. Uh, now this all took place behind the scenes. Peter never would have known that if the Lord hadn't told him that. You and I wouldn't know that if the Lord hadn't said that. And when we look at that account in the gospel, uh, in, in the gospels of, of Peter's communication with the Lord and the Lord's communication with Peter, Surely it's not there just to tell us that this is a casual conversation that Peter and Christ had as they walked along 2,000 years ago. But there is in that uh, a lesson for us that God is lifting the mist slightly, letting us get a little bit of a glimpse as He does in other circumstances or situations in the Word of God into that warfare that surrounds us, Peter did not know that Satan wanted to sift him as wheat. God told Peter that, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, so it didn't. There isn't any possibility that Christ could, have, could pray any prayer that wouldn't be answered, that he could in, in, in fact pray something that is contrary to the will of God. That is impossible in the light of, of scriptural revelation. <clears throat> so, Peter's faith couldn't uh, fail. From our standpoint, it not only failed three times, if you, if you study the account very carefully, Peter denied Jesus six times, three times inside the court and three times outside the court with a curse, and it was the Lord who reminded him by causing a rooster to crow. You know, I had once, I, I, I had a rooster once that I wished that the Lord had stopped from crowing, but that's another story. You know, that, that sort of looks like a, a stupid way to remind him, but that's the way that God did it. I guess he could have had the, the stars, you know, spell it out. Uh, Peter could have... Uh, you know, looked up in the heavens where the, the, the stars said, See, Peter, I told you, 
you know, God, God could have done that. It wouldn't have, have been hard to do, but, but he used the rooster to do it. Peter went out and wept bitterly, but a supremely sovereign God was behind all of that. You know, our, our first parents, Adam and Eve, were placed in the Garden of Eden, and, and what does Satan do? Well, he comes along in the form of a serp, serpent uh, to question the validity of what God had said. The importance and the accuracy of the Word of God. Well, here's an illustration of the Christian. Peter belongs to God, and Herod, the enemy of God, raises his hand against certain ones in the church. You know, it's, it's sort of nice that it doesn't occur to everybody all at once. Uh, Satan hit Eve, but Adam apparently wasn't there. I don't, I don't know how long it was before he got home, uh, whether he was naming the animals or counting the fruit trees or, or whatever. But apparently Adam wasn't there when, when, when Satan uh, first approached Eve for some reason or other. I would not attempt in any way to get into the mind of the devil why pick on Peter? Well, he always stuck his foot in his mouth. He's an ignorant fisherman. He doesn't know very much theology. Uh, you know, I, I don't know whether any of those things are true. And I, I think there's sur the surmising is a foolish waste of time. What the text says is that Herod picked on Peter. He had it out for Peter. He picked on some others and eventually wound up picking on Peter. Absolutely no possibility of escape. Don't let that escape your notice. Peter's kept securely in prison. However, prayers made without ceasing by the church of God on his behalf. What I want you to realize is what Christ had said to Peter on a previous occasion. Peter ought to know that while he's there in prison. I mean, is it too far a stretch of, uh, of imagination for me to imagine that maybe as Peter sat there securely in prison that he remembered the, the words of the Lord? But Peter, I have prayed for thee. I think that's wonderful. You know how desperately I need to know moment by moment in every one of life's unpleasant circumstances that Christ prays for me with groanings which cannot be uttered. Even though, even though what we saw in Peter's first experience was denial with a curse. Denial with a curse. Dearly beloved, listen to me. We tend to think I believe, at least this is my my belief. We tend to think that Peter's faith failed, but God says it didn't. And here Peter is, secure in prison, no possibility of escape. But I must know, and you must know, God wants us to know that behind the scenes, prayers are being made. I'm told that he's not only bound with chains which are doubled for security, but he has to sleep between two soldiers. Now, if you're bound with, with chains and you're sleeping between two soldiers, they're going to have to be desperately tired for you to crawl over them and get away with, without waking them up. Chains are going to rattle. It's not a very comfortable situation. But it sure is a secure one. You know, if you don't, if you don't kill the soldiers, you're, you're not going to get away. I mean, you might get away with, you know, with killing one of them. But not with two of them there. 
Somebody's going to wake up. So his situation, folks, is helpless. So I'm going to suggest that Peter looks here like Israel and Egypt, and I'm going to further suggest to you that we know from the comparison of other scriptures that Christ had prayed for Peter. Here we see prayer made by the church. I want you to recognize that Christ is the head of the church. I'm, I'm not trying to minimize at all our prayers for one another, not in the least. In fact, I'm a firm believer that, dearly beloved, that we intercede before the throne of grace for one another. I want you also to see that Christ's prayers are joined with ours. It seems to me that you only have two possibilities in Scripture. You either pray in the name of Jesus Christ or you don't. You don't. You know, you go to a football game and uh, Reverend uh, so-and-so of the such-and-such -such church you know, is asked to, to give the invocation and everybody stands and there's quiet and over, uh, over a 2,000 megawatt address system or whatever it is, you know, comes this prayer and it ends with, Amen. You know, and you, and you can actually, pro, you know, hear the people in the stadium sort of sigh because, you know, there are Christians there who didn't, they didn't hear him say in the name of Jesus. You know, I hasten to point out to you that that, that isn't some kind of cure-all or formula. What God is saying is that our prayers are one of, of two. Either we pray what Christ would pray were He in, in, that, in this situation so that we are in agreement with Christ or we're not. If our prayer is in agreement with Christ, it's answered. No strings attached. If it's not in agreement with Christ, it's not answered. And I want us to realize that Christ joins with the prayers of the church. That's true prayer. Now, what happens was a messenger from the Lord came to him. In Israel's case, uh, in Egypt it was Moses, but it was God who sent Moses to Israel and Egypt. They didn't sit there and say, now, now this is the way that we'd work it out because we want deliverance. You know, I'm going to suggest to you that Peter doesn't know the way out. You know, uh, did he hire an attorney? I mean, I have no idea. Uh, I see no indication in the text that Peter has made any attempt uh, whatsoever to escape or of correcting his situation. I see no indication in the text that his situation is other than hopeless. Hopeless, dearly beloved. Utterly hopeless. Peter's helpless. So was Israel. Israel didn't ask God to deliver him out of Egypt. You know, God sent a messenger to Peter. I, I assume this is a heavenly messenger here, you know, for it was a messenger from the Lord. Uh, surely a messenger, that mess could have been uh, Michael, Moses, uh, uh, Gabriel. There's no constraint in the word whatsoever to say whether or not this is an angel in the sense of, of, of which we use the word now. It looks to me like here that this particular messenger is a heavenly messenger. Gabriel, Michael, or, or some other heavenly messenger. I don't know, but it's God who sent him to Peter. I do not want you to miss sight of the fact that behind the scenes, possibly unknown to you, although I believe God reveals enough for our comfort that, that God has not forsaken us, these are not loose words when he says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. It doesn't matter whether Peter's in prison or whether Peter's playing golf, whether Peter's happy or whether Peter's sad. The truth is, I will absolutely never forsake you. Strongest language that God could use. Strongest language that he could use.
Now, I, I admit that I may be pushing something in the text with which you won't agree, and but you, you know, as I pointed out, you don't have to agree with me on anything. You could object and, and you could preach that Peter is delivered because the church prayed. And of course, the horror of that is, well, you know, I'll, well, I'll, I'll just, I'll put it this way. I cannot believe that if the church hadn't prayed that Peter had rotted in prison, that we'd never had, we'd never had Peter the apostle. We'd never have had first and second Peter written and, and all of this would have just gone down the chute. Now I think that depends entirely on your presuppositions. Dearly beloved, God is either sovereign and his, and his will and His purpose is done in the life of the believer, or it's not. Or He's not. He's not sovereign. If He's not sovereign, somebody is. Okay? Satan, you. You know, to suggest that, that God is not sovereign and, and not in control is just wrong. I do not believe that your sermon would jive with the rest of the Word of God that Peter was delivered because they prayed, and if they hadn't prayed, then, then Peter wouldn't have been delivered. That I do not think will fit squarely with the rest of God's revelation. I believe that the account is given, not that we have to pray in order to get him delivered, but that we ought to enter into the suffering, the fellowship, the communion of affliction one with another and the Lord Jesus Christ. I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail thee not. I believe the text is telling us that our prayers ought to be in line with God's. The messenger came. Now I read in verse 7, And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side, and he raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. He smote Peter on the side. I don't know how you read that. The word smote means to strike hard, and said, I, you know, I know, Peter, you're surprised, but really I'm here. It looks like Peter was asleep. It looks like Peter didn't see the light, that Peter didn't recognize the messenger, and that he had to be hit. That's the way Israel was in Egypt. That's the way you and I were. We kind of got smoted. That's the way Paul was on the road to Damascus. Struck blind. I, I don't know. Somehow in our popular evangelism, we're persuaded that Paul was headed to hell until God uh, met him on the road to Damascus. Struck blind. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I've never once in my life believed that. God says that He was a chosen vessel from His mother's womb, separated by the grace of God. Finally, God chose to reveal His Son in Him but that doesn't mean that Paul was, was ever anything but God's. And we're so prone to, to put all of our emphasis and all the responsibility on the human folks that we have reduced our God to a gentle old man in heaven who just hopes that somebody listens to him. God hit Peter. Smote Peter. God smoted Paul and you and me and Israel in Egypt, woke us up. So he tells Peter, get up quickly and the chains fall off. The chains fall off. You know, amazing to realize that, it, that, that in my chains or whatever state I'm in, whatever, whatever it might be, that I am immediately set free in the presence of God. Folks, have we stopped to realize, you know, that we'll never know God's comfort until we suffer? How could one possibly 
live a life with no sickness, no problems, no pain, everything's great, never had a job problem, never had a health problem, never had an income problem, never had a child problem, kids were all little angels, you know, everything was super, and then, and I'm going to, and then I'm going to stand up at 67 years of age and preach to you about God's comfort? I think that you'd probably leave some kind of comment in the comment section. You know, what does Steve know? I think that you'd have every right to, to say, Steve, you know, there, there hasn't li you haven't lived long enough to sin long enough, to sin enough to know about the grace of God. How would I know about the grace of God, dearly beloved, if I, if I did not sin? How could I know about the comfort of God if there was not a great trial of affliction? And I think that there are many Christians so weak, so childish, so immature that God has to protect them from this kind of suffering. They'll never know. Herod chose to vex certain of the church. Why not everyone of the church? Because under the sovereign power and authority of God, there were those whom God wanted to learn. Peter, get up. The chains fall off. Instantly, angel says, okay, put on your coat, put on your, your shoes. So we did. Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. That's the prop proper response. Garment. Think of what we're garmented in, in Christ. Okay, for any one, one of you who are, are chosen vessels of God, somehow uh, or other, we've uh, so diluted the grandeur of God's grace that we say, you know, well, if you put on your coat and if you put on your shoes and if you follow me, then you'll go to heaven. I can't see any possibility in the text that Peter could do anything but what he did. Israel did not want to leave Egypt, but they left Egypt. Israel did not want to wander 40 years in the wilderness, but they did. Follow me. So he did. He went out and followed him, and he didn't even know that it was true did not know that it was true what was done by the angel, but thought that he saw a vision. You know, we're, we're uh, greatly alarmed when someone, you know, makes a step which we call a step of faith and then they're not, and then they're not certain, you know. Well, you know, I, I don't think, Steve, I don't, I don't think that, that that guy over there, I don't think he's saved. You know, he still smokes. He still watches CNN. Still erects a giant Santa Claus on his rooftop every Christmas. You know, still still goes to Disney World and, and who knows what. When the truth is, is that the blind man who received his sight outside the temple said, Who is the Lord that I may worship Him? Peter didn't even know that it was true. Thought he was dreaming. They went past, they go past the first guard, they, they, they go past the second guard, they come to an iron gate that opened by itself, imagine, you know, opened by itself, opened of its own accord, they went out and they passed on th uh, through uh, one street and then the angel leaves, the angel left him. This seems so characteristic of, of Israel's experience. God delivered them out of the land of Egypt. You know, they devastated the land of Egypt. They borrowed from their neighbors, their friends. You know, I think if one looks at the facts as they're revealed in, in Scripture, literally tons of money and jewels and gold and property were carried out of Egypt by Israel's one and a half million people or more. Boy, what a grand experience. You know, the eldest son of the enemy died. You know, you could borrow anything that you wanted from a neighbor. Just get it. You can have it. Just go. Just get out of the land, Pharaoh said. Give them anything they want. Just leave. What a grand experience. 
And the next thing we know, they're being threatened by Pharaoh's armies in the wilderness. You know, roaming in the sand and the lice and the bugs and all the grandeur seems to be gone, you know. You know, now we got to go out in the morning and gather manna and for 40 years we have on a, a, what on the outside appears, you know, seems to be a miserable existence. It isn't that God has forsaken us, but that you and I are called out and delivered for service. And it isn't easy, folks, all right? Iron gates are not going to open on their own accord. Chains aren't going to just all of a sudden fall off. This is a spiritual lesson of the grandeur of that deliverance by God through the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but, Here's where you lose just about everybody. Now we face a life of affliction and difficulty. We don't want that. But if it were not there, how would you know you even trust Him? If God is always there opening the gates and providing everything and making the guards go to sleep, everything's miraculous, where would any test of your faith be? Is it unreasonable for God to want for us what we would want for our children? You know, you can do your homework. You can do their homework for them, but they wouldn't learn nothing. Verse 11, Peter came to himself. Came to himself. Verse 11. I believe the message there is that you and I don't know truth until we've been delivered out of error by Almighty God. I believe this world can bestow wisdom and honorary degrees and all kinds of education, and, but there is no absolute truth separate from Scripture, from God's Word. You know, a man may know much about mathematics and history and geography, but that knowledge can't be put into the framework of truth separate from the Word of God. I do not believe any human who is not delivered by the grace of God has come to himself. I believe it's inconceivable for my, you know, modern knowledge to be in the framework of truth separate from the Word of God. Now he said, I know what happened. You know, Peter says, I, as a good boy, I did this and I did that, so I, I got out of prison. No, that's not. Absolutely not what happened. The Lord has sent His messenger and has delivered me out of, of the hand of Herod and out of, from my enemies and from the expectation of the people of the Jews to whom Christ said, Ye are of your father, the devil, but it, but it is the Lord who did this. That was Peter's message. The word delivered is our word for salvation. We could translate that. The Lord has delivered me. And that's what God has done for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. He's delivered us from the hand of our enemies. Delivered us from other situations. In the broader sense, we see Peter's deliverance from bondage. You know, in the nearer sense, his deliverance from sin. But folks, I want you to recognize that in the account that we have before us, Peter is already a chosen vessel. He's a chosen vessel. And the, and the deliverance that's in the context is the deliverance not the giving to Him of eternal life. I believe it's imperative that you and I do just that, that we give serious and deep consideration to what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. I've, I've said it so many times here. I, I know it's old hat to, to some of you. 
but I believe in, in popular churches and modern day evangelism, little thought, if any, is given to the sovereignty of God and the finished work of Jesus Christ. By far and away, the great stress of importance is on the human, not on God. He thought about this thing, came to the house, actually come to the house where they were praying. Is it unreasonable for me to, to, to believe that God leads us out of and into fellowship with believers? Or that He'd go to all the trouble of redeeming us and then forsake us? Did Peter know that they were in this particular house praying for him? God leads us into the fellowship of believers, which is best for us at that point in time. You know, it may not be blessed hope forever. I don't know where it is. I, I don't solicit folks to come here, but, but I do, in, to, in, to some extent, I do encourage folks to stay here. The fact is God is going to lead us into the fellowship and community of the saints, which is needful for us at that point in time. At that point in our time, in our, our growth, our maturity, our understanding, that's where He went. And they didn't even recognize Him. The very one that they were praying for. You know, the girl that opened the door, you know, ran away with it shut and locked. And when he came in, when he did come in, they were, they were astonished, we're told. What did he do? He delivered unto them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And once again, the emphasis is on what God had done. What God had done. And now Peter says, I want you to go and let these, uh, uh, and, and tell these things to James and the brethren. And he departed and he went into another place. Apparently, he was not permanently with that particular uh, group of believers. He was there for what was needful for him and them at that moment. God took him someplace else. But what he decided is what God had done for him. Folks, when the Lord Jesus Christ touched the maniac of God, he said, go and tell what great things God has done for you. Folks, I am not, I'm not going to dare suggest to you that prayers for healing is unbiblical, but if God healed me from cancer, from, from radiation poisoning. That would not be my message to you about what great things God has done. You know, I, it would be the gospel. I don't mean to belittle healings of any kind. I wouldn't do that, folks, for anything in the world. Maybe it sounds like, you know, I, I do. Personally, it seems funny to me to come on here and say, you know, you know what? What, a, what great things God has done for me. He kept me out of heaven. That somehow doesn't ring true to me. It doesn't, it doesn't sound like a great thing. The great thing, dearly beloved, that God has done for me is Jesus Christ personally and intimately died in my place a substitutionary death without my asking Him to do it so that I am eternally redeemed by the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is great. I, I want to tell you what God did for me. Jesus Christ is the long-awaited for Messiah. He delivered me. He, he, he delivered me from, my, from the chains of sin, of bondage to the law, and of Satan, my enemies. He redeemed me through the death, His death on the cross, where I stand before Him without spot. God did this. God did this. That's His witness. That's His testimony. Think about it. Two chains sleeping between two soldiers. 
Now, come on. How did he get out? Well, I don't know. He just, he just makes me kind of smile to think what they must have, the conversation that they had, you know. Well, you had these two soldiers. What, you didn't hear anything? No, I didn't hear anything. But, you know. Well, how do you think he got out of the chains? Boy, it beats me. I, I don't know. But, but he did, you know. You guys let him go? No, we didn't. We didn't let him go. You know, you must have. You must have let him go. You didn't hear anything? No, no. Then you let him go. You know, it must have been quite a conversation. Well, I don't think that's the the purpose of the story that we should, you know, kind of sit here and laugh about the situations with which uh, those guards went through. It was no laughing matter to them. In fact, it culminated in their death. The Word of God culminates not only in our redemption, dearly beloved, in eternal fellowship with Him, but the destruction of the enemy, Satan, and his foes. They're in a losing situation. I'm not suggesting that we should glory at all in the destruction of our enemy. That is not the point. But I believe that the certainty of victory has a tremendous amount to do with the ease or the comfort or the strife with which we, we carry the affliction. You know, maybe I hadn't worded that quite right uh, or very well. If, if I know that I'm going to lose, it's a rough fight. But if victory is certain and the destruction of the enemy is certain, then dearly beloved, the suffering is much lighter. It's no wonder the Lord you know, could say, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Because not only is our redemption assured through the finished work of Christ and our eternal life, but also the destruction of the enemy. Well, you say, well, Steve, you know, that's not necessary. All I want is eternal life. I mean, you know, all I want is victory. You know, the hope of glory. Why should the destruction of, of the enemy be in, in the account at all? And I may not be able to, to point this out to you like I'd like to. The, the point is that without it, God is not just. You know, it may be a great satisfaction to us just to get to heaven because, well, you know, now we've apparently made it some kind of a game rather than the, the action of a sovereign and righteous and holy God. And if the account ends only with our deliverance, it violates the justice of God, not the vengeance of God. The authorized version uh, translates it on several occasions, vengeance. But the word is justice. If there is not ultimate destination of the, uh, for us, I, I, well, if there's not destruction of the enemy, then sin isn't as really as bad as God said it was. You know, if it's not necessary that the enemy be destroyed, that's tantamount basically to saying that it's not necessary that Christ die. You know, what are we doing? We're, we're making sin in opposition to the will of the sovereign God less than what God says it, it is. And if, and if God is, as, as He reveals Himself in the Word, it requires not only our deliverance, folks, but the destruction of our enemies. And that's what happened. In fact, we see that Herod made a speech and Herod uh, met his demise. You know, he had been uh, quarreling with the people. You know, and they now joined together and they sought an audience with him after securing the support of Blastus. Uh, they, they asked for peace because they de de depended on the king's country for their food supply. So he's in his, wearing his royal robes. He sits on his throne. He delivers a public address to the people. They shouted, This is the voice of a God, not of a man. And immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. 
eaten by worms and died. <coughs> Excuse me. Wow. Luke does not say, folks, that Herod died immediately, only that he was struck down immediately, according to jo Josephus. Many of you know who he is, historical writer. Herod was immediately incapacitated by a severe pain in his stomach. The pain lingered for five days before he died. The book of Acts tells us that the cause of death was worms, that is, parasites, probably directly from the hand of God. Reminds me of Satan. You know, I'll, I'll be like the Most High. I'll ascend up into heaven and be like the Most High. Herod makes the same kind of claims. On the other hand, the Greek says the Word of God, verse 24, continued to grow and multiply. And multiply. I'm not sure we'd have said it that way. What we'd have probably said is, you know, we'd have, we'd have put the emphasis on the number of believers. You know, well, the membership jumped from 10,000 to 50,000 or, or something like that. But the text said that, that because of the way God did it, it's the Word of God that grew and multiplied. We put the emphasis on numbers. God always puts the emphasis on His Word in, in the Lord Jesus. So verse 25, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. And that takes us into chapter 13, uh, where we find that the Holy Spirit had uh, set some apart for the work uh, to which God called them. Dearly beloved, it doesn't take much of a student of the Word to realize that the closer the Word of God comes to completion, the less we see of signs and miracles and wonders and voices and thunderings and so forth. You know, Paul, he had miraculous uh, you know, deliverances early in his ministry and he was beheaded late in his ministry. I want you to be fully aware that Colossians tells me that the work laid upon Paul was the completion of the Word of God. There is no power in heaven or earth that could have killed Paul until that job was done. I'm glad that God used Paul to complete the Word. And I praise God that, that we can hold that book in our hands. I'll show him what great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Uh, it almost leaves me speechless. I have no idea what Paul might have said had I interrogated him in the middle of his, his human life, but I must admit that now that were I to go to the courts of glory and interrogate Paul, wherever he may be, without any question in my mind, his answer would be, that God's way was right and best, no question, no complaint, and I trust that, that that is true in my own life. Isn't it marvelous that in all of that fellowship, God has not lost sight of two people. He didn't need Paul to complete the word to us, but he did. He used him. Now we find that they departed, they sailed for Cyprus. I don't know how they knew that's, that's where God wanted them to go, but that's, that's where they went. That's where they went.
So they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews uh, at the fifth verse. This is the seventh time in the book of Acts that we've been, we, we've seen Christ preached or we've seen the, the words preached the word of God or preached Christ. And I've tried to point out to you that this is our supreme responsibility not to preach what we think it is or what we think it ought to be, but what is the word of God? What's the gospel? I delivered unto you the gospel, how that Jesus Christ was born, that he lived, he died, he died for our sins, he rose again the third day from the dead. That's what the Bible says the gospel is. The Bible goes on in that same text and says that, that it's in that good news that you stand, that you're delivered. And no place in the text does it say that if you'll accept this, then that's the good news. What it says is what we're to, to declare, that Christ died for our sin, He was buried, He rose again on the third day, day, on the third day from the dead. That's the Word of God. And this book is a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not a revelation of man, but the revelation of, of Jesus Christ. The Word of God preached in the synagogues was the same Bible, same scriptures that the Jews had there where Jesus Christ was identified as, as Jehovah, the Messiah, the one who was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. Now, if you believe that, folks, that's because God made you a new creation in Christ. If you don't, it well, it may well mean that that you're not, or God has not yet chosen to reveal His Son in you. I don't know, and I'm not called to judge. What I'm called to do is proclaim the Word of God. Jesus Christ lived. He died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again on the third day from the dead. He is the promised Messiah. Happy, blessed New Year as we go into 2024. We love you. We truly do. Let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your word, for thankful for one another, thankful for the truth of your word, for the gospel which redeemed us. We're so grateful that you've allowed us and you continue to allow us the opportunity while we have time to study your word together, to feast upon it, that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you. I ask you filter out all of that which is error but seal to our hearts only that which is truth, that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.